Allergy-specific immunotherapy is a concept that if you have an allergy to a specific uh, allergen, then you can inject yourself with, let's say, that same allergen, and it will turn off your body's immune system. At least that's how I understood it about five hours ago. I honestly thought that this was the biggest snake oil hoax that I've ever heard of, complete hogwash and utter, you guessed it, utter bull poop. So why did this seem so outrageous to me? L allow me a second to explain. So if I have some type of allergen, let's just say this is pollen, and it goes in, if the immune system recognizes that, now granted the immune system shouldn't recognize it, but if the mechanisms that are supposed to stop that fail, and your immune system recognizes it, then every subsequent exposure should increase your body's response, not decrease it. Or at least that's what I thought. So I base this on the fact that let's say we have a bacteria. Let's call this a gram-negative bacillus. The bacteria is infecting you, and upon the initial exposure, your body will produce it will activate T cells and B cells and produce a moderate amount of antibodies. That's at first exposure. On second exposure, your body, as soon as it sees that, uh, that pathogenic bacteria, it will go into overdrive and produce thousands and thousands of these antibodies. So that's the second time. Any subsequent exposure after that should have a dose-dependent concentration of these antibodies produced. It literally should be to the point where you can make a, like a dose response curve where you have the number of inoculations and you map that against the immune response. And so it gets this your first time you've been inoculated, you get an immune response that's very negligible. Second time you get a really good adequate immune response, your next time a little bit higher, and eventually it will level out. But uh, subsequent inoculations will stay fairly high. And that's because we have something called memory cells. These T and B memory cells have uh, basically, for lack of a better word, they have a memory. They remember the pathogens that they've seen, and so every time after that, they go freaking crazy. So the reason our bodies protect us from bacteria is because they go crazy on the bacteria. And that's exactly why allergies are bad, because if your body goes crazy on something that's not harmful, then you harm yourself doing it. So how in the world does subsequent inoculations of allergens cause your body to stop going crazy? That's acting in the opposite way of what it should act. In order to understand all this, we're going to take a quick look at what causes allergies. So um, your, your body produces B cells and T cells. So we'll, we'll say this is a progenitor cell. And then you can either make a B cell or you can make a T cell from this. And you can make many other types of uh, lymphocytes, but these are specifically leukocytes that can be made from a progenitor cell. And these leukocytes, so there's a there's couple different types of B cells, but let's just say that we start off with a naive B cell. And these T cells, we can have T helper cells, and we can have uh, T uh, cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic. And so, um, the way these are formed, so the B cells are formed in the bone marrow and the T cells are formed in the thymus and as they're being formed they get exposed to self antigens. So these T cells, these immature T cells have a MHC complex, ma major histocompatibility complex. Uh, and what that means, is, so histo means tissue, so you have this major tissue compatibility. So am I, is, is this receptor compatible with my tissue? And so what your body does is it presents some of the, its own body tissue to this MHC complex, and if the T cell binds to it too heavily, then the T cell gets destroyed. And there's a, so that's the negative selection, and there's also a positive selection. 
So, and this would actually be the sep second step, the negative selection. The positive selection says we present the body tissue to the T cell. If it doesn't bind quite well enough, then it gets destroyed. So it has to have this optimum ability to bind, and specifically to bind to self-antigens. So essentially, we want the T cell to be able to identify what is us and what is not us. We also don't want the T cells to go crazy on things that are harmless. So in this process, the things, the T cells that would bind to harmless uh, antigens like pollen are typically eradicated. And a similar process goes on for B cells as well. Now once in a while, you get one that sneaks through. And so that's not good whenever the, the crazy ones get through and they start attacking either self or harmless antigens. And so just to be specific, there are four types of uh, hypersensitivity disorder. So there's four types of hyper, and I'm, I'm not going to write it all out, hypersensitivity disorders. And we're talking about type 1, which is basically an allergic reaction. So type 1 is known as immediate hypersensitivity, atopy, or allergy. If you want to learn about the other four, I recommend Googling the Help Hippo. Help Hippo and put hypersensitivity in that search. So the order of events is on the first exposure of an allergen, uh, you will get activation of a Th2 cell. Now, in a typical person, the concentration of the amounts of Th2 helper cells is very low. And they're usually not the first thing to be activated. So but when they are activated, some things seem to go crazy. So the T cell is activated, and the B cell has bound to the antigen and become activated as well. And when these two come together, this T cell starts producing some cytokines. So specifically, cytokines IL-4 and IL-13. So this B cell... He may have been making IgGs or IgMs in the past, but whenever he's exposed to these cytokines, he preferentially changes to start making IgE. So again, this is still first exposure, so you're making a bunch of IgE, and that IgE uh, becomes bound to this FC region on a mast cell, and mast cells have thousands of these FC receptors on them and so you could literally get thousands of IgEs bound to one mast cell. It's probably important to point out really quick that all immunoglobulins uh, from a single B cell will have the same variable region. So all these immunoglobulins they have something called a variable region and a constant region. And between different cells, so if you have two different B cells they will both produce an IgG with the same constant region and they'll produce very different variable regions. But within the same B cell, so if one B cell can make multiple different kinds of immunoglobulins and in that specific B cell all the variable regions of these different kinds should be the same but the difference that makes it a different kind of immunoglobulin is that it has a different variable region. And the variable region of this IgE, I mean this uh, constant region of this IgE, will be the same as the constant region of every other IgE made by your body, and, but the variable region will be different between cell to cell. However, the constant region of an IgE will be different than the constant region of an IgG. If that wasn't super confusing and you're able to follow along, it's probably because you're really smart or because you're in medical school and not because I use some kind of great didactic skill to explain it. So back to our, uh, our diagram. So we have these IgE sensitized mast cells. So these mast cells are sensitized, but they're not activated yet. Whenever you have a repeat exposure, they become activated now typically, a, ma a single mast cell will carry IgEs from several different types of antigens. So whenever you have an antigen come along here and bind, it won't activate the mast cell because it requires the binding of 
multiple areas, usually two or more uh, IgEs have to be bound to activate it. But whenever you have IgE of a specific antigen in such a high concentration that it coats all of these FC receptors, it becomes very easy for that mast cell to become activated by one specific antigen. At least that's how I understand it when I read through the book. Okay, so you got the activated mast cell, and what it's going to do is it's going to start degranulating and sending out all these, in, these mediators, and you're going to have a reaction. And so on second exposure to an allergen, you get these, this allergic reaction. So let's take a closer look at exactly what the allergic reaction is. So you get the signaling pathways to release granules. You also have an enzymatic uh, modifications of arachidonic acid. And then you get transcription activation of cytokines. So in the release of these granules, one of the main things you're going to get are histamines and proteases. And so the histamine is going to cause vascular dilation, smooth muscle contraction. And uh, the other thing is you're going to get tissue damage. On the, uh, the modifications of lipids, specifically arachidonic acid, the thing that you're going to get is basically it's going to promote inflammation. And then on the cytokines, cytokines are going to recruit eosinophils, neutrophils, and it's going to recruit more Th2 helper cells. The eosinophils and the neutrophils are going to uh, basically liberate more proteases and um, kind of follow up with the tissue damage. The Th2 helper cells are going to continue to recruit even more leukocytes and produce more cytokines. Now for reasons unknown to uh, a couple of different textbooks I've read and a research paper, the um, immunotherapy will work by activating these tolerogenic antigen presenting cells. No one knows exactly why or how these can get activated without uh, going through the other uh, pathways of mast cells reacting first, but some of the theories include the site or the type or method of inoculation, and so maybe getting a shot or putting something under your tongue, and that's what this, so this is subcutaneous uh, immunotherapy and this is sublingual immunotherapy. The sublingual has uh, got a lot of active exploration because it seems to be doing a great thing. I guess uh, from what I've read, sublingual seems to be safer than subcutaneous. And um, so there's uh, several, it's a good way to treat foodborne allergies. It's close to the site of the allergic uh, reaction, but far enough away that um, it can still go unnoticed by some other mechanisms. The oral mucosa specifically shows a lot of tolerance to inflammation. It has um, rapid wound healing, little scarring. It, uh, it lacks the inflammatory cells around the mucosa, and it has a high permeability to the allergens, so it would be a good place for inoculation, it seems. So how does this work? This tolerogenic antigen presenting cell will present the antigen to a CD4, CD25 positive T regulatory cell. And what that will do is it will start producing of, uh, of several things, interleukin-10, IL-10. So I'm going to put that up here because the first IL we saw were IL-4 and IL-13. So IL-10 gets produced by this guy and uh, basically what it does is it shuts down everything. It tells the B cells Stop making, uh, stop making IgG or IgE, and start making IgG. So go back to produ produ uh, producing IgG, and this is a non-inflammatory type of immunoglobulin. It suppresses the dendritic, uh, the inflammatory dendritic cells. It uh, so you can just go through and look. There's, you know, so starting down here, suppression of the mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. I'm not sure exactly how that works because the T cells don't directly interact with those cells, but they do directly interact with the B cells and the uh, dendritic cells. It's going to cause suppression of the T effector cells, um, Th1, Th9, Th22, and 17. I don't honestly know enough about immunology to explain how that uh, 
plays into the allergic reaction. And the last thing I want to say is that the, some of the research is saying that uh, IL-35 may be uh, assisting IL-10 in some of these mechanisms. And so in summary, one, nobody knows how it works. Nobody really knows why uh, this uh, immunotherapy is not activating the typical response and it is activating this other response. But uh, anecdotally, it's been done for over a hundred years and so it's got some progress that seems to be working and there's more uh, active investigation finding new and better ways to make it work better and uh, two it can be quite dangerous and so if this is done it needs to be done in the presence of a qualified health care provider you can have local reactions such as erythema, pruritus, and swelling. You can also have systemic reactions, which it would be like anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can be either mild or it can be severe, and it can be so it can be life-threatening. So you can actually die from anaphylaxis. So I use a lot of sources, um, watch a lot of videos. Khan Academy was good for a really good review of um, immunology, just kind of the basics of it. There was some Hell Pippo videos I liked. Uh, There's a lot of other research papers that I read that were basically worthless, but I, I kind of want to highlight this um, research paper right here. Uh, the Fujita Hiroyuki Michael B. Soika at All Mechanisms of Allergen Specific Immunotherapy, and also the textbook was really good. So uh, now's the time where I, I answer questions. Um, I probably don't know the answer to your questions, but I'm going to pretend like I have a really good answer. E go ahead and ask.